folks to session two of, uh, which is focusing on becoming open. It's part of our open professional learning series, which is, um, is being hosted by You Imagine in partnership with the Scholarship in Online Learning Group. And we have three sessions in this series. The first one we already have had, and you can find a recording of that on the You Imagine website. Um, we, we have this session, which is the second session, and the third session will be in early November, which will actually be launching the We Imagine Open Season, which we will, we will be holding in the month of November. So with these open uh, PL sessions, um, these go for one hour. The format is usually a half hour presentation followed by Q&A and general discussion. Uh, this, this uh, because it's a scholarship in online learning group session, we do have a pre-reading uh, and that, that was a journal article by Catherine Cronin called Openness and Praxis. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our two presenters today. We have Julie Lindsay, who's our Open Pathways Design Leader, and Lenny Morkel kinsbury our online learning designer with you imagine in the division of learning and teaching. And today our presenters will be exploring the concept of um, moving from what is open to how, how do you become open as an academic. Uh, so I'd like to hand that over to you now, Julie and Lenny, to start your presentation. Please, anyone who's got any questions, type them in chat. We'll follow up with those after the presentation and then we'll have an open general discussion for people to make comments about the reading, uh, as well as any of the, the ideas that are being presented in Julie and Lenny's presentation today. Thanks, Julie and Lenny. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, so I'm going to kick off and you can see the schedule that we have there, all these sections of our presentation. And Lenny's actually controlling the slides, so sorry in advance, I'm gonna to have to keep saying to Lenny, next slide, please. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. <laughs> Right, so I want to talk about becoming open and the sub theme to this is you are more than your knowledge and I want to point out that you can actually access these slides now if you want to through that tiny URL uh, link there so you can put that into your browser and uh, grab these slides. Next slide thanks Lenny. So just to, to recap, when we met a month ago, we talked about what is open and we talked about open educational resources. And I've just thrown that definition up on the slide, which is one that I used last time, just so that we're clear what open educational resources are. And basically my message today is, or our message today is that OER is not enough. Open educational resources is not enough. Can you have, an open, can you have open content without open practice? And I must say that Lenny and I have been talking about this all week, actually, as we've put this presentation together. And the depth and the breadth of material out there is quite amazing if you're interested in, in exploring. And we do have a, a resources and references uh, slides at the end of this presentation. But it's also an evolving space. Uh, the thought leaders in this space continuing to share their leadership with us and their thoughts, but their thoughts are evolving as well. So it's a really interesting uh, set of literature to be interacting with and uh, interesting themes that are coming through that we're going to share some of those with you today. Thanks, Lenny. So this is um, on that theme that OER, open educational resources are not enough. It's not enough. And this is actually, these diagrams are from um, a paper by Jordan and Weller, and that's Martin Weller, actually, Katie Jordan and Martin Weller. And the image on the right hand side shows the mapping of themes across time. Uh, oh, sorry, the image above that heading, which is like a, a bar graph, shows the mapping of themes across time and provides a useful history of openness. Now, we're not going to focus, you know totally focus on history, that's not our point here, but I wanted you to see that because you can see that um, it's interesting to note that in the rough timeline created by these researchers that open practices started, um, OER, sorry, open practices, the green line there, started around the time of Web 2.0, of course, 
uh, around the 2004, 2005, 2006, and that's when many of us started blogging. We started using wikis. Uh, Twitter came out for education 2006, 7. So that's when we really got our hands on open tools, and that started to push that whole uh, open educational practice. Now, the image on the right hand side. This is from their research paper. Uh, it, it represents the citation network of the papers included in their re research in relation to openness and education. And it's annotated to show the, the prevalent themes. So the layout shows clusters of nodes according to an algorithm which determines the best fit shared on, based on shared links. And the nodes are colour coded there. So the message from Jordan and Weller is that while the, the discourse, the conversation around open education resources emphasises opening up quality educational resources as such on a global scale, what has emerged from their research and other research I'm going to share with you today is a recognition that access to OER is not enough and needs to be combined with open educational practices. Thanks, Lenny. Next slide. So we start to hone in on open educational practices. So this is actually a close in of that, that last slide to show that this, this is really the intersection of social media, open access publishing and open educational resources, according to Jordan and Weller. So it raises the um, understanding of the context in which open education resources are used as we move towards that better understanding of open practices. So open educational practices inherits, inherits the technical tools from pre-existing communities, but also acknowledges that access to resources alone is not enough to fully realise the potential of openness in higher ed. Uh, and also features a trend towards recent critical reflections on openness and the plural meanings and the history of the term itself. So let's go a little bit further into this. So putting open into practice. And these are some of the themes I'm going to explore as we go through this. So moving beyond this content-centred learning, sharing, learners and teachers sharing, open scholarship, uh, networked participatory scholarship links in with that, open teaching, open pedagogy, and this whole idea of critical digital pedagogy. We'll, we'll take a quick look at that as well. Further defining, <clears throat> sorry, further defining open educational practice. And this is from the um, University of Tasmania. It's actually an open course that you can dip in and, and take a look at yourself. So this diagram is defining open educational practices, including the context, mediating artifacts and stakeholders. And if you look at it carefully in the centre circle there, that we have the stakeholders, the policy makers, creators, users, managers, revolves around OER. But further out, we have the uh, mediating artifacts and of course, the context. So open educational practice, according to this particular uh, course, is, has three important dimensions. Developing strong engagement with stakeholders, providing support to ensure that the open education resource creators and users are guided adequately and that technologies are available to assist with storage and dissemination and also raising the understanding of the context in which OER are used, open educational resources are used. So around all of this we, we've got to think about open educational practice and I'm painting the picture and sort of in, in broad strokes at the moment. Thanks, Lenny. Next slide. So the pre-reading that we gave to you was by Catherine Cronin. It's an article based on her PhD thesis, which has now been released. Her thesis came out this year. And her definition of open educational practice, uh, collaborative practices that include the creation, use and reuse of open educational resources, as well as pedagogical practice in practices, employing participatory technologies and social networks for interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation, and empowerment of learners. And I've put that last bit in red because that's, you know, that's, I think, one of the most important pieces of that whole 
definition, the empowerment of learners. And when we say learners, we mean academics, students, everyone, basically. Cronin talks about the continuum of increasing openness. Her research has shown that educators, learners, all in the one basket basically, are on a continuum in terms of their digital networking practices, digital teaching practices, and personal values. Oh, sorry, Lenny, next slide. <laughs> uh, so let's explore those a bit, bit further. Next slide. So digital networking practices move so you can move, as a as a learner you move from not using open educational practice for teaching or learning so in other words you might have a university based digital identity uh, you might use social media for personal use but not necessarily for professional use and then as you move along the continuum you start to use open educational practices so there's it becomes that combined use of uh, university and open digital identities and maybe a little bit of conflict. Who am I online? Am I representing the university? Am I representing myself as an am I myself as an ac academic, or is that me personally? And this is where people start to get confused, actually. And the use of social media uh, starts to blend. And this is where people start to think, well, no, I need a separate professional account on Twitter that's not linked to my personal account or Facebook, et cetera. And this is where you, you do start to make some decisions about your open practice. And then as you move further along the continuum, using OEP for teaching, you have a well-developed open digital identity, a blog, Twitter, for example, and you use social media for personal and professional use, including teaching, and you're comfortable and you have it all worked out how you use it. Thanks, Lenny. Next slide. And then the continuum for digital teaching practices. So starting over uh, on one side, not using open educational practice for teaching. So you might be uh, within the university system, the virtual learning environment. At Charles Sturt University, of course, we use Interact2, which is a Blackboard platform. Uh, you might use free resources with little concern or knowledge of how to use them. So you might not be really understanding copyright and creative commons. And then you move, you shift into uh, using open educational practices for teaching, where you do a blend, use the university VLE and open tools, and you're using and reusing open educational resources. Next slide, things. And then the continuum for personal values, where on one side you're not using OEP for teaching. So you're, you have very strict boundaries between personal and professional, between staff and student, very strong attachment to personal privacy, uh, which is where we all start, of course. And then as you start to use OEP, uh, you're still cautious about crossing boundaries, but you're starting to explore and, and pushing those boundaries. Uh, and then of course, using OEP for teaching, um, accepting some porosity across boundaries, personal and professional st student and staff, s values still around privacy and, and um, but including openness as well and seeking that balance. Thanks Lenny, next slide. So moving forward, I just wanna mention this uh, uh, digital scholarship and openness. And I just, the, the changing and shifting sands is interesting uh, in this slide, and I'll just very briefly explain. Martin Weller wrote The Digital Scholar in 2011, um, and he talks about more by the network and online identity they, esta they established, so that the, um, this is your, the academic perhaps, um, is, is identified. Uh, and then of course, in 2018, he's just written a, a blog post or an article about updating the Digital Scholar. Um, and he talks about perhaps it should be called open scholarship rather than digital scholarship. So he sees openness and open practice as increasingly difficult for ac academics to remain unaware of. Next slide, thanks. Back to Cronin again. Now, she talks about the dimensions of openness, and this is really interesting, and we're gonna come back to this whole, this privacy piece as well. So the, the outside circle areas, the, the, the values, the valuing social learning is a dimension of, of openness. So moving away from didactic teaching uh, and encouraging more student engagement is part of that. 
I'm, I'm going over this quite quickly, but she says more in her article, of course. And then the challenging the traditional teaching role. So this whole broader identity as an educator, as I've been talking about, and breaking down those barriers between teacher and student. Next slide, thanks. I want to focus particularly on the, the inner circle here, that balancing privacy and openness and trying to work out as you move along the continuum as an open, educa uh, as an open educator, practicing open educator, trying to work out the boundaries. And you may actually be asking yourself, um, starting from the nano level, uh, will I share this? What have I got? What will I share it? Who, who will I share it as? Are you sharing it as a professional academic or a professional in a university or a professional in a school? Uh, or are you sharing it personally? Who will I share it with? And will I share it open, openly or am I sharing it to a select group? So, so these are really important decisions to make and important understandings to know what to do when you've made that decision. If you want to share it openly, openly do you know how to do that, for example? And then on the other side, of course, digital literacy and digital literacies are those capabilities needed for us as individuals to live, learn and work in a digital society. So I wanted to fo focus on this as well in terms of um, digital identity and how open educators have well-developed identities. They use social media, media proficiently. Uh, they build personal digital literacies to communicate and they foster the same skills and dispositions in their peers and students. So they basically lead by example. That um, GISC digital capability framework, there's a link in the uh, references slide to link to that as well. And there's some excellent literature up there on the GISC website. Thanks, Lenny, next slide. Okay, so this is just a little diagram and, and this, this is maybe a little contentious and this will be good if it comes up in our discussion in terms of whether you agree with this or not. But uh, openness as a mindset is something I wanted to talk about. So it's, it refers not only to the technology to, but to the practice of sharing and openness as an ethos or a way of doing. And does this apply to all educators and learners? And if it does, I really see that as the, as the big circle you know, if we if we move along the continuum, trying to you know striving for open educational practice, then basically that's the the world that we're working in. And then within that, of course, we have these other themes or elements. Uh, and I've sort of done them sort of connecting there, but maybe you know, it's open to interpretation how they all connect together. And that's just a sample. That's not a definitive list there either. Thanks, Lenny. Next slide. And then just a couple more slides here. Openness as a pedagogy. Now, according to Wiley, and there's a couple of references there for Wiley, um, open pedagogy differs from other pedagogies. Um, and because that difference is quite narrow and specific, it may only make sense in the context of broader pedagogical traditions. So he talks about the fact that how would open constructionist pedagogy differ from constructionist pedagogy, for example? So what does open add to each of the existing pedagogies that we know. So in terms of constructionism, uh, while a constructionist pedagogy only encompasses learning by making, that's the, the Papert version, the, coming from Papert, of course, Seymour Papert, um, an open constructionist pedagogy also encompasses learning by revising and learning by remixing things you only do when working in the context of open educational resources and the five R permissions. And I really encourage you to go into that Wiley uh, 2013 article where he talks about, or blog post actually, where he talks about beyond the disposable assignment and the five R permissions, uh, retain, reuse, revise, remix and redistribute content, of course, for educational purposes. So although... Um, Wiley questions the prescriptiveness of Hegarty's attributes of open pedagogy. I've included it here because this is a really good article as well. So Hegarty has done some research uh, and she lists these attributes of open pedagogy and I won't read them all out there. Uh, but you can see, you know, if someone says to you, well, what is open pedagogy? You can say, well, it includes this, this and this. And I think they're all quite valid. Next slide, thanks. 
And just uh, to dip into critical digital pedagogy, we're getting a little bit deeper here. So a critical digital pedagogy demands that open and networked educational environments must not be merely repositories of content. So they must be platforms for engaging students and teachers as full agents of their own learning. Now this has implications and ramifications for pretty much every university in the world at the moment in terms of what we're doing with online learning, um, on the online learning model at CSU, transforming online learning, uh, whether we're, we're really trying to transform this, this repository of content into an engaging learning environment. So in this critical digital pedagogy is an approach to teaching and learning predicated on fostering agency and empowering learners. And I'll leave that one there. And one more slide from me. Thanks, Lenny. So steps to become an open educator, some suggestions here. Uh, and the, the question is, does open educational practice lead to the use and creation of open educational resources or is it the reverse? Now, the literature tends to say that OER leads to REP. Cronin's research uh, has actually started to show the reverse. So once again, it's an evolving space. So things like um, connecting with other like-minded learners, looking for innovative ways to enhance learners' experience, uh, flattening the learning, so less hierarchy between you and your students, for example, the use of open learning technologies, as we've mentioned, blogs, wikis, etc., and being able to engage with social media, adopting new learning design approaches, and adopting open and critical pedagogies. Thanks so much. Lenny, over to you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'm just going to take you on a bit of a, a building on what Julie has talked about um, in terms of becoming open, but looking at um, our journey that we've just taken recently in designing for learning for a completely open platform. Um, and just to give you some insight into the sorts of things that we have discovered and are still discovering as part of that process. Um, so why does, why look at designing for the open rather than just learning design um, in a broader context. Uh, why go there? Grania Knoll has said in her um, publication, Designing for Learning in an Open World, that because of the broader social context, um, we need to better equip all learners for lifelong learning with skills, like Julie has already said, that keep them um, able to constantly uh, work in a constantly shifting societal context and technology rich, rich context. So our emphasis in learning and teaching shifts from individual behavioralist approaches to more authentic and social and um, contextual approaches. And from knowing facts and procedures to be able to locate facts and use information on a needs basis and switching as Julie's already mentioned from traditional teaching roles to broader contexts like teachers might even find that there is a blur between um, teaching, learning, designing and curating, for example. And also really shifting from a belief-based implicit approach to, to teaching and learning to a design-based and explicit approach where we actually design for learning. And in designing for open learning, uh, or any learning for that matter, we need to remember that we can't prescribe what learning will occur, but we can design for learning. And this is one of the lessons that we've learned um, in our uh, exposure to designing for an open platform as well. Um, the learning, as Julie's already mentioned, but just to reiterate, is about being social, authentic, learner-centered and flat. Um, catering, and that's because we have to cater for multiple pathways, multiple motivations of students. They're not just doing the learning to get a degree at the end. They might be coming in for a whole range of reasons. Um, that there are multiple forms of engagement with the learning and multiple learning activities. So we're looking at things like sequencing and sampling and tool and resource creation and, and, and um, curation, not just um, the resources, scaffolding, learner pathways. These are things that you would have heard if you've been working in learning design uh, with your subjects, but it's just about rethinking um, the way that we approach that. And just again, reiterating something Julie has already mentioned, this idea is that it's not just about providing open learning content 
but it's about designing for learning. And I love this quote from David Wiley, also in that same article that Julie has mentioned, and we've got the link on the um, resource list. Using OER, the same way we use commercial textbooks, misses the point. It's like driving an aeroplane down the road. And yes, the aeroplane has wheels and it's capable of driving down the road, but the point of an aeroplane is to fly at 100 miles per hour not to drive and driving an aeroplane around simply because driving is how we've always traveled in the past squanders the huge potential of the airplane. So if we think about it, that in the context of learning and, and the use of OERs, rather than just grabbing OERs because they're free to access and replacing our current practices of the way that we use those OERs, if OERs are free to retain, reuse, revise, remix and redistribute, then we have to start asking ourselves those questions about what is the relationship between those capabilities and effective teaching and learning in the open. And another question we need to ask is then, how can we extend, revise and remix our pedagogy and our design to build on those sorts of capabilities of OERs? One of the ways that we might like to think about that and that um, Julie and I have started to think about in terms of, you know, in terms of the work that we've been doing in Design of the Open is this concept of the four C's of open learning. So I know there's a lot of things out there, frameworks, you know, there's the five R's, there's the four C's, there's the seven C's of learning design. Um, but I'm going to take you through now our journey using this four C's of open learning connect, curate, create and contribute and try and give some practical examples of how you might start to think about your own um, progression into open learning and teaching in, in that space uh, through this framework. And also then take you into a course that we've been, that we've developed that's running now and show you some examples of each of these. So connecting is, uh, talking about those relationships of building connections through open networks. It's those sorts of things like connecting with others via social networks or open projects so that we can share and learn from others about what good teaching practice is. Um, it's also about taking that step of making your teaching practice and your materials accessible to people beyond your students. So for example, um, going into Open Education Resource Commons, which is a platform where you can uh, create your learning and, and teaching materials, see what other people have done, share, remix, reuse, and get some feedback um, as well. Uh, collaborating with others on teaching and, and research projects and also for our learners, connecting our learners with authentic experiences and learning experiences. So going back to what Julie highlighted from um, David Wiley, that concept, you know, of killing the disposable assessment, um, giving students more authentic uh, tasks to complete that has a life beyond the course. In our journey into designing for open um, on the get ready, get set, become a digital online learner course. Uh, one of the first things that stands out a lot to me is and about the connection is how collaborative um, the process is. It's, uh, I think it was Grania Canal who said something like, no one person can be expected to know all the tools that there are to support learning and teaching, all the different strategies and techniques technologies that you can use. So it's about bringing people together and using diverse skills, knowledge and experience and flexibility across those roles. So we might have a subject matter expert, we might have a project lead, learning designer, media technologist or designer, editors, marketing people. Um, the strategic manager and director needs to be involved because they're driving the, um, the, the, the that piece that Julie showed you with the, the circles. It's also about policy. Um, we also uh, have had access to external technology providers, direct relationships and links with those people and educational technologists and also external learning designers and other support from within CSU. And just to make a point that those might be roles that sit sort of as independent people, but for example, Julie works across being a subject matter expert, the project leader, learning designer and a media technologist and an editor in, um, in helping us get together this course. And I might be working across being a, the learning designer, medical te, media technologist and editor, and our director 
also works across all of those roles, um, you know, offering learning design advice and editing advice. So it really is about being open and breaking down those um, containers that we might otherwise um, see for these roles. So I'm just going to show you an example. I'll just drag this over. So the platform that we're using is called Open Learning. And it's a platform that is specifically designed for a social and learner-centered approach to learning. So it gives students the opportunity to form their own networks. Um, at the bottom of every page, for example, there's a comment section where students can interact with each other. Students have control over building and designing their own learning portfolios in different ways. Um, and it's the same as our courses in, um, at CSU, we still scaffold, we still have learning outcomes that are attached to this, the learning outcomes still drive things, but we're very conscious of being able to provide for those multiple pathways, the multiple motivations that people have, uh, multiple forms of engagement. So on this very first page, the home page, the very first thing that students do is connect. And I know that we do this also um, in a lot of the welcome pages in CSU. So people, um, but in this case, we're asking students to grab some uh, free to use images and remix some information. So already they're engaging um, with some open materials and remixing to tell us a little bit about their responses and their digital life and how uh, they cope with their digital life. And we've had some terrific examples, as you can see. Um, things like people telling us that their digital life is like a butterfly and and because they want to explore horizons. So the students are already connecting with each other and contributing um, within this way. And it's about them, not us giving them the resources to use to form this um, artifact, but them going out and finding and using and remixing open resources. Just step that aside again and go back to the slides. The next segment on the kind of circle of the four C's is curating. And um, this is really about curating open resources. And this might be a place where people are already tapping into or might be familiar and comfortable with going through and finding openly licensed resources through Creative Commons. Um, if you need to find out about Creative Commons, that link there will take you to the Australian Creative Commons org site where you can find out what that means and the different license types. Um, all resources in the public domain. So they give you or your students options to reuse, remix materials to support your learning and teaching goals and find and select and review open resources um, and also gives the opportunity for students to access real world examples and data sets um, which may not otherwise be accessible in lecture notes or classes. So for example, I don't know if you knew, but the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, is, create, is um, through CC license for most of the things and they tell you very plainly on their site the bits that aren't. So again, uh, dragging this back across. Um, one of the pages that we have in the course actually teaches students um, to go through and teaches them about curation of digital information. Um, and I just wanted to bring this to your attention because it was, it also shows some examples of, for example, that Julie talked about the flatness um, between the, the role of an educator and the educator as also um, a learner and designer in the space. And that requires, we've learnt, this degree of building a bit of trust in the learning space. So Julie openly shares her own um, curation examples, um, gives the students access, we've given students access to all of these tools. And then we've got these, uh, the, the whole course is built, we've killed the disposable assessment and we've got a um, running through the whole uh, course, students are building a scrapbook of their own. So they're learning to curate materials, they're learning to create materials, and they're sharing this, they're live in, so not, so the audience is not an academic, the audience is not um, their tutors, the audience is 
the world and the students are getting an authentic experience of sharing their experience of becoming a digital online learner with others. So they're actually contributing as well to their, to that conversation. And we got them to, uh, also another thing, everything that we do in here is like, we have structured, um, structured tasks, but the tasks often, gi often give choice because we're catering for multiple motivations and choice and types of learners. Um, so they've got a choice of which kind of tools they want to learn to use. And we have put supports in place that get them to start to become open in their practice, to declare their blog and share it with each other via this Padlet board. Um, and I'll show you an example. Um, for example, this is one of the students um, blogs. It's the, these, it's kind of incredible to watch because some of these students have never, or these people have never, people have never um, blogged before and they're getting in there and designing their blogs and starting to post their experiences. And they're also contributing larger, um, in a larger way to um, that whole knowledge society. For example, this post, um, she shares, I came across this and shares the article that she read it in um, and it, the student is directing and also engaging in that contribution without prompting through the learning activity. I think I've skipped ahead a little bit, <laughs> starting to mention um, creation of resources as well. Um, creating open resources is about developing a wider community practice and sometimes creating open educational resources can be a way to extend the value of the work that you do as an educator. Um, and also we have opportunity to increase the opportunities for students to be involved in the creation of resources um, beyond their peers and beyond the course is one of the key things about um, openness. One of the things that we found in designing this course and working through this course was you can curate up to a certain point and then sometimes <laughs> you just might um, not have the material that you need and you need to, you might need to step up and create your own resource. We did that in terms of, um, we were looking at the DISC framework for digital skills and we were looking at a whole heap of other skills for um, uh, digital skills frameworks. And we decided that the best way to do that, and they were all Creative Commons. Um, and so we remixed and we came up with our own digital skills framework. And in this course, students go in and they get an opportunity to assess their skills against this digital skills framework. And then they get a little bit of a rating, which tells them if they're a novice or a bold beginner. And they use this as the basis of guiding their learning. Um, so the students are in control of that pathway, their pathway through the learning um, based on their skills that they discover in our digital skills framework. So we created this um, by remixing and reusing um, concepts and bring it together for the purpose of this course and what we wanted our learners to explore. The students also get opportunities to create within this course. Um, there's a whole section here in module three uh, on digital tools and all of our activities encourage them to go and find the tools that are open, um, find resources that are open and bring them back together and create their own things and then contribute that back through their blog to the wider community. Um, for example, in this, uh, this example where they're looking at their personal learning network, Julie shares examples of her own tweets, um, tweets with people that she has actually included resources about so that students get a, an idea of that kind of open network of, of um, learning and practice and can connect with people. Um, and then they produce their own elevator speech, which they then get to post on a blog uh, if they want to or tweet. And Julie's uh, presented these examples that people can, basically within the learning materials, you're providing materials that students can then um, revise and remix to use in their own context. Um, so, 
that last point is about contributing to the knowledge community. And as you've seen through the examples with the scrapbook challenge, we're trying to provide students with opportunities to extend their work, have them critiqued, critique each other's work um, and contribute back to the knowledge about becoming a digital online learner. And I've just also included a slide in there, um, which if you were thinking about ways that you might want to get started with connecting, there's links to the OER Commons, there's some tools for starting, you know, that are simple to use for using, for starting blogs and online portfolios. I've got a couple of examples of people who have developed their own, including Julie's. Um, and we've got the Twitter uh, handles for Catherine Cronin, um, Grania Knoll and David Wiley. That's another way of connecting and also um, some tools for curating. So that's it for me. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Julie and Lenny.